Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustee Candidate Forum. I'm Dr. Terry Easley Geraldo. I'm a professor of communication studies here at Johnson County Community College. This event is co-sponsored by the Johnson County Community College Faculty Association and the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. All candidates are invited to attend and all but one accepted. Mark Hamill did not accept the invitation to participate in tonight's forum. Thank you to the seven candidates who are here with us tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to thank some people and let you know the format for tonight's evening. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Johnson County for helping us plan, organize, and host this event tonight, and especially for handling and organizing our audience questions. They have an amazing system. I'd especially like to thank Marie Hernandez and Debbie Kitchen for all of their work. They've spent many Zoom calls and emails with me as we planned for tonight, and they've been wonderful to work with. I'd also like to thank the Faculty Association, Dr. Jim Leiker, our president, as well as the FA Recommendation Committee, who worked on preparing questions and communication for tonight's event. Last, but certainly not, not least, I'd like to thank our incredible staff here at Johnson County Community College, our multimedia services, video production, and marketing departments. This could not happen without them. They've helped us with the webinar, with registration, recording, as well as publicizing the event tonight. We truly have the best people here at the college. Now to the format for tonight's event. This is an informative candidate forum, not a debate, so there will not be rebuttals or back and forth between candidates. Each question will be asked of all candidates. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question before we move to the next candidate. We have three prepared questions from the FA and the League, and the rest will come from audience submitted questions. If you'd like to submit a question, please refer to the email confirmation you received. It contained the webinar link for tonight and also has a link to submit questions. We will try to get to as many questions as we can during this hour and a half. A rotating order was created for each question, so the same candidate isn't speaking first or going after the same person each time. And the candidates have the order we will be following for tonight. And at the very end, we will have a one minute final statement from every candidate to conclude our events. This is being recorded and will be shared on the Johnson County Community College YouTube channel. And finally, it's 2021 and we all know technology, the internet and Zoom can have their moments. So please be patient if we have any technical difficulties. All right, so let's get started with the evening. Um, candidates, I'm happy to repeat the question if you need a refresher, so please ask and I'm happy to do that. So let's get started. Our first question tonight, and our first person is Lee Cross answering. The question is, discuss what an open access and comprehensive community college means to you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you to the entire faculty association. Um, <clears throat> my entire family went to JCCC, and I think the first part of open access means simply having access to it. And what does that mean? I think transportation, I think uh, having ease of access. Uh, we completely redid the campus in the last four years to have, have the campus better marked, have a more pronounced uh, front door and student center along with wayfinding. And I think that means <clears throat> having uh, an adequate number of counselors and full-time faculty present to help marshal our students uh, through campus and, and, and through their, their college experience. So I, I would say at a minimum, literally having access and my first ever political campaign was Citizens for Light Rail in 2001 uh, with Clay Chastain. And so having access uh, literally to the campus, uh, being able to find their way around, and I think the human element, <clears throat> an asset of being guided by uh, our, our faculty and staff when they get there. Awesome, thank you. Next question goes to, is to Don Rattan. For me, open access means that it's available to as many people as possible. Um, when we look across our county, everyone wasn't the uh, best student or top of the class or even thought that they would go to a four year uh, college. So we have a lot of access. We have a lot of access points into our college. And we have a lot of, and when I think about comprehensive, I think about all of the majors and all of the ways and the pathways that someone can get 
um, a, an education. Uh, some of the things I've looked at are the health information systems, the welding program, animation and game development, and then the railroad uh, six week program. So it's very comprehensive in what is offered at our school. And I also think about comprehensive in that there are anything from the six week conductor program that you can do, one year uh, certificates, two year associate's degrees, and then um, all kinds of continuing education, as well as small business help, which I've taken care, I've taken courses in myself or sent my manager to. So for me, comprehensive envelops a lot of needs in the community and makes us really a true community in the center and the heart of the, of the city in the heart of our county. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is Jay Moyer. Hello. Well, I believe that open access and comprehensive um, goes to the heart of what we're trying to do at Johnson County Community College, which is to provide anyone who wants and needs it a quality education. Um, I believe that this uh, goes right in line with my platform of equality, education, and opportunity. I wanna make sure that we are creating um, safe spaces on campus for um, members of communities that are disproportionately affected by discrimination. Um, I want to make sure that we are respecting the educators who are the first line of defense at the community college. And I also wanna make sure that, especially when it comes to open access, that we are making sure that we are removing every single barrier possible um, when it comes to students being able to actually take classes at Johnson County Community College and receive that quality education. And then um, uh, talking about making sure that the community college is comprehensive, we also need to make sure that we are offering all those avenues. And I think I agree with what Don said about, make, about um, uplifting all the programs that the community college has to offer making sure that those programs are accessible as well. Thank you. Wayne Sandberg. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, uh, all access uh, really means uh, it's for everyone. Uh, Johnson County is growing by leaps and bounds. We have a uh, older population here where, where the college is the hub of the arts and culture. There's, uh, there's a programs for, for uh, young, there's programs for old, and um, having access uh, is uh, what a community college is supposed to do. It's supposed to be for all. And uh, I believe that uh, this college has been a leader all along, not saying that it can't get better, it can. And, uh, we as uh, trustees will uh, be in line to keep that thing going. This, uh, the courses, uh, whether it's uh, uh, right now uh, with uh, Edgerton and uh, the containers going to the world, we are one of two in the whole United States, the other be Joliet, Illinois, that has access to the whole world this county is exploding and uh, and our college is just going to be at the forefront of everything. So the programs, uh, whether people go on for four year degrees or 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 have technical training, we're going to be there and we're going to do it right. And we're going to be known throughout the world. Thank you. Joy. Hosting. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, um, Johnson County Community College Faculty Association and the League of, <clears throat> League of Women Voters of Johnson County for hosting this forum. I'm very grateful to be here tonight. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about my experience with Johnson County Community College. You know, I returned to the college uh, in the mid 1990s uh, because I had stayed at home with my kids for about 10 years while I was getting them off to school. And uh, once that happened, I returned to school so that I could become a, a teacher and I needed to fill in some coursework so that I could go on to get teacher certification. Um, Johnson County Community College offered me that opportunity to uh, find a pathway forward 
to the career path that I wanted. When my, old, my youngest daughter graduated high school and didn't have any idea what she wanted to do, uh, she too looked at Johnson County Community College to figure out where she might uh, access uh, something that would, that would help her uh, launch herself as a young adult. And she ended up uh, being uh, taking the uh, massage therapy program at Johnson County Community College. Uh, that program sustained her for 16 years uh, after she uh, entered uh, her undergraduate work uh, and then went on to her master's program and her PhD program uh, and became a professor at an institution in Tennessee. For both of us, Johnson County Community College served as a conduit uh, to get us where we wanted to be in the end. Uh, and to me, th this notion of open access and comprehensiveness uh, really reflects the notion that uh, we wanna be able to offer these opportunities for every person who wishes to find a pathway, whether it's a new student coming in right after high school, or maybe it's somebody who comes in for a career change. We also know that accessibility is, is more than just about making accommodations for learning and physical challenges that students might have. Uh, certainly COVID taught us in these, these last 18 months that accessibility also means do people have the internet? Do they have the technology? Do they have the skills to access online education? So I think there are a lot of things that we can do as trustee members uh, to really make sure that our, our college stays um, accessible and has a, a comprehensive array of opportunities for all students who want to find, find their path forward. Thank you, Joy. Next, we have Jerry Malnar. You're muted, Jerry. I'm used to teams, <laughs> apologies. Um, so when I think of access, it's uh, a number of things. Uh, you know, access to the uh, campus uh, will also need to address those that have special needs, for example. But uh, one of the things I've noticed when I've uh, been knocking on doors in regards to the access question, I have a number of parents out there right now who are very concerned about whether their students are ready uh, for the college level work that they're gonna be embarking on, mostly because of what's happened as a consequence of COVID. So I think as a, for it to be accessible, that's another big piece of that is to be able to uh, accommodate uh, those students that are uh, gonna to need to do a little bit of catching up, if you will, uh, so that they can uh, be successful. Um, in terms of comprehensive, uh, having a college uh, like Johnson County that does a good job in regards to not only credit programs, but also uh, continuing education programs. So offering a, a diversity of, of, of offerings that's uh, not only relevant to the students, but also relevant to our community as well, because uh, we, we certainly have uh, a lot of unfilled uh, skilled labor jobs right now that uh, we're going to need to address uh, as a board if we're going to really function as an effective community college because that's another uh, question that uh, is brought to me when I'm, I'm knocking on doors and asking people what their issues are as well. So, so th there's an opportunity there, I think, uh, for us to, to grow those programs. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Snyder. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for, for corralling all of us tonight and leading the process. And a broader thank you to the Faculty Association and the League of Women Voters, uh, both important organizations in our county. With regard to the, the question, access and uh, comprehensiveness are two of the tenets of what makes a, a community college truly a community college and valuable and a key asset for where it resides. And Johnson County Community College is clearly a key asset for our community. <clears throat> To, to me, a open access denotes being affordable to the students that want to come here, being open and available to any student that wants to come here, and would agree with others that mentioned our campus and our whole broader um, environment at the college needs to be welcoming to all. And so I'm proud of the, the DEI and other efforts we've made because we do want people to come to the college and be comfortable and, and then produce a, a environment where they can 
uh, thrive and flourish. In addition to that um, core classes and being affordable, we also need to make sure that it is open to students of all learning levels. Um, that means offering um, classes that allow people to catch up and also higher level classes. I'm proud of the efforts that the college has made for, for many decades with our CLEAR program for students with intellectual disabilities, also the access services that we offer for uh, individuals with um, learning challenges. Finally, on the comprehensiveness, I think the most important aspect uh, for the college is making sure that our workforce development needs match the community's needs and we're always training the workers of tomorrow and for today and along with that offering cultural opportunities uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, our next question and Joy Coaston will answer first. This question is, can you please give two examples of how you've supported inclusion, diversity, and equity work in the past? And can you provide your vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion for Johnson County Community College? We'll start with Joy Coaston. <clears throat> well, thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, I was really very happy when uh, Dr. Uh, Bone uh, started to face some of the challenges that uh, he faced uh, as he started his career at Johnson County Community College with COVID underway. But one of the very first things that he, uh, he did was he established a culture of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion at Johnson County Community College as a program. And for me, it's, it's an important um, marker for what, how we should be uh, behaving as uh, role models for anyone who comes to our campus. We know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a critical issue in every organization in our country today. And when I, in almost every uh, organization that I've ever uh, worked in, we have uh, had many, many different kinds of programs that spoke to the diversity of whether it be students or to the employees of uh, those organizations. So I really believe that establishing a culture really goes beyond just putting it in policy. It means that other people, everyone within the organization has to uh, think about how they're going to behave themselves, how they're going to include people, whether it's um, in, in their religious thinking or their uh, uh, sexual orientation or how they might just address someone who's from another culture that, uh, than they are. Um, in, in the classroom, it's, it's really a challenge sometimes when you have a, a full room full of students who are so different on so many levels. Uh, they have different learning experiences, different worldviews, uh, and different um, life experiences. Uh, so it's just really important that every person that the student comes in contact with understand that they first have to listen and they have to get to know the individual in a way that allows them to respect whatever they're bringing to the table uh, in that particular situation. So um, bottom line, you know, we, we really can't dictate kindness or empathy in any organization, but we really can behave in a way that it is welcoming and inclusive of all people and demonstrates that we are an inclusive community. And I would hope that that would be um, kind of the standard operating procedure of all trustees uh, and all Johnson County community employees going forward. Thank you, Joy. Next, we have Paul Snyder. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is a, is a key topic that the board is, is working to um, move and include uh, in our college going forward. Specific examples of what I've done, um, certainly I've supported our efforts uh, that since I've been on the board. And I would like to give um, some credit to trustee uh, Angelina Lawson, she really did a lot over the last couple of years to, to help steer the board toward this, made it a priority when we were interviewing presidents and certainly our, our, our uh, president who's been on the job a little over a year now, Dr. Bowne, uh, has embraced this topic. So in addition to supporting those efforts, I've also supported efforts to get it included as one of our uh, strategic plan options. Uh, that plan has not been adopted yet, but is out for uh, kind of internal and external community review, and we expect that to be a, a key part of that going forward. When I was on the Johnson County Parks and Rec Board last year, I supported uh, enhancements uh, toward DEI um, that are just now making their way through the board. We, we started some staff discussion last year, and those um, are, are 
poised to be approved here in the next month, I would imagine, at the Parks Commission. So this has been something I've been open to and tried to be supportive of when I can. I think examples that, that really make it work on a campus is being open uh, to other people's viewpoints and being an understanding and giving everyone a little grace. That's something that we've heard a lot uh, with, with COVID is giving people grace, but it's such an important aspect of trying to make people feel wel welcome um, on campus. And I think we're heading in the right direction. I'm proud of that. Thank you. Next, we have Don Rattan. First, I'd like to say that I like the quote uh, that is attributed to John F. Kennedy, that a rising tide raises all ships. And so when we talk about diversity, when you improve a targeted group's lot or uh, situation in life, we all improve as a community. Community is the key word in this discussion. And Johnson County Community College is serving new and different audiences at all levels. That includes faculty, staff, students, residents, vendors, employees, and community partners that have differing expectations and needs. And so we've got to understand that. As far as my personal work on diversity, uh, I worked at Procter & Gamble for 11 years. And, and during that time, I did some horizontal assignments in human resources. So I was in the position to learn about diversity and not only diversity um, for diversity's sake, because it is the right thing to do as, all, as we are all connected. Also for the business case, because at the end of the day, companies are doing diversity because it's gonna impact their bottom line or many of them are. And there are studies that show that there's a 19% increase in um, sales when you have a diverse workforce and the level of innovation across a company increases. So I was in the position to do diversity workshops at Procter & Gamble. I also did, um, when you're a big public traded company, you had to do an affirmative action plan that was um, in my work plan. And I also was in different affinity groups that worked with the leadership to talk about how to get women and minorities promoted to the executive level and to make sure that we had the core competency and the staffing and the pipeline to get there. Um, most recently, I have been invited by different groups groups, um, whether it's a church group or a women's group, or um, there are a few groups during COVID quarantine where I talked about exactly this, that representation matters. I also wrote an article in, in Kansas City Magazine in the last couple of months, and it talked about representation matters. It was called Barbie to the Boardroom, and it talks about everything from representation and seeing a Barbie that looks like me or my daughter, all the way to seeing someone who looks like me in the boardroom. And again, how that matters to be able to see someone who looks like you, who has some cultural uh, overlap with you leading the way and what that matters. Again, it makes us all going back to the quote about a rising tide raises all ships. We're all better for it. And yes, let's all admit it's a lot more work to try to reach out and understand someone that doesn't have a lot of overlap with your culture, but it's always worth it to do it because we all are better off for it. Finally, I had a meeting with Dr. Bound about a week or two ago, and we did have a discussion about equity. And in the discussion about equity, he talked about three parts to equity, especially with respect to the college. The three parts were access to college. Let's ensure that the college is accessible and do targeted outreach to diverse populations. Two, success at college. Let's create Don, this I'm picture. Inspired. Oh, Sorry. thank you. Don over. Thank you, Don. Next, we're going to move to Jay Moyer. Thank you. Um, I believe that I'm, I'm very happy to hear that this question is being asked because I believe that having conversations like these are incredibly important. Um, I openly identify as gay and gender nonconforming um, and that and diversity, equity and inclusion and focusing on these things have been a huge part of my life. Um, for the past three years, I've been a member of Equality Kansas of Metro Kansas City sitting on the board. And I have, um, and I currently sit as the vice chair of that organization, most notably in um, recent past, we have gone from city to city in Johnson County, passing non-discrimination ordinances, making sure that LGBTQ folks have been protected from workplace discrimination in Johnson County. Um, if I am elected to the board, I would be the first LGBTQ trustee to sit on the board. And I would also be the first non-binary elected official in the entire state of Kansas. 
and I'm running because I believe it's voices like mine and bringing voices like mine to the table and having my ideas and my experiences represented at levels like these is incredibly important. Um, and what I would like to do with the college is to make sure that we are continuously uplifting the voices of people like me and making sure that there is an immediate change to make sure that everyone has space on campus and everyone feels welcome and included on campus. Um, and the biggest thing that you're gonna hear me talk about when it comes to DEI, um, and this is also something that the college's DEI report that just came out found, is that there is a necessity for a well-resourced space on campus where we can make sure that um, black, brown, indigenous, and LGBTQ students and faculty feel included. That's one of the big things I want to do when I'm elected. So um, I think that this is an incredibly important topic and thank you so, so much for bringing it up tonight. Thank you. Next is Jerry Malnar. Thank you. Um, diversity and inclusion is the best path to achieve excellence in any endeavor. And uh, I've built my career based on that those as core tenets. I build my teams uh, in my professional life by seeking and finding the best talent to get the work done. And it's even more important now than ever with, with my company at Cerner, where we're in a high stakes industry, highly competitive. The work is very impactful, it affects lives. And so we need to find the absolute top talent to accomplish that. And we're looking for a lot of diversity of experience for a lot of the work that we do as well. So not just particularly in healthcare, we're looking for people who have had experiences from other industries as well, because that has definitely informed our, our business model and has made us more competitive. So I'm very uh, bullish on those two. In regards to equity, I think, well, it's laudable what we're doing right now in healthcare in order to uh, attempt to uh, uh, create some equity in terms of healthcare outcomes, because there are people who have disadvantages that are unable to, for example, get to appointments. They live in areas of the city that are food deserts. And so what we're doing right now as a company is we are leveraging technology to help overcome some of those barriers so that we can get patients access to better food, transportation to get their, to their appointments, uh, and, and really leveraging all of the community resources uh, to, to, make, to be successful in accomplishing that endeavor. And this is a grand experiment that we're undertaking in the healthcare space I think we're gonna be able to, to make some uh, significant movements, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. But I think equity in healthcare, that's a, that's a laudable goal. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lee Cross. <clears throat> how much time do we have? I forget. You get two minutes. Okay, thank you. And thank you to League of Women Voters. I didn't want to forget them. I, I thank Dr. Koston for reminding me. And uh, specifically in my personal life, as I understand the question, examples of diversity would mean, frankly, I worked about two years in inner cities across the country on various campaigns for the uh, Democratic Party, the National AFL-CIO, and Clean Water Action. So I actually worked and helped put together a majority minority uh, campaign in Cincinnati and worked uh, many uh, inner cities and entering suburbs which was a culture shock for a kid from the exurb of Lawrence. Um, my last two paralegals, the, uh, the paralegal that really taught me how to do personal injury was a gentleman named Teddy Van Ness, who was a gay man that later got hired by the, uh, the federal district court after he left my firm. And then my current paralegal who's been with me for five years is a Latina named uh, Alexandria Raymond. And um, I just hired a new uh, female uh, 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 contract counsel. Actually, I have two female of counsel with my firm. Uh, my, life, my wife and I are lifetime members of the NAACP. Uh, I've had a, a close relationship with that organization and 
uh, here and across the country. And then now I need to check the rest of my notes here. I I'm glad that Dr. Molnar mentioned food. I, I think that uh, that's a critical part, I think, of the K-12 K through approach to include a more diverse population and give them access to education. We've developed a food pantry here and a program for uh, low-income students to be able to eat on campus. I mean, I think that is absolutely an access uh, to education issue and frankly justice, but I thank the doctor for raising it. Uh, I would say uh, Trustee Lawson probably did the most work to bring about a DEI uh, committee. I did propose that she uh, chair it last year and I think uh, her effort, along with the, the arrival of Trustee Smith Everett, helped us accomplish that. Uh, I'm proud that we have a metro right now to include zip codes in Missouri to bring, um, I think, more disinfected uh, uh, students to our campus. The legislature, in its wisdom, five, 10 years ago, thought we should let the market decide. And I was someone who championed the fact that we should. We should open up the doors to Missouri and uh, keep tuition low here. I'm proud that we've frozen tuition for about five of the last six years. Um, my wife and I have, uh, have spent uh, quite a bit of time and resources with the, the JCCC International Club. Uh, I'm extremely proud of our record minority hires in the presidential cabinet. I helped vote for the first ever minority uh, trustee, a trustee mm -hmm. candidate. And then I will have to correct Jay Moyer just slightly. My law school classmate, Melody Rail, um, is, is a gay woman, les lesbian, who was on the board at the time I came on. And I actually ran against her. So it's a very rare day. I'm not trying to take that away, but I did just want to point out that, in my opinion, and one of the reasons I love doing this is that we are a paradigm of, of progress. And uh, I'm extremely proud of what we've done. And I, I think, Ann, Thank Dr. you, Lee. Brown has continued that, and I've also promised shared governance with the faculty, and I'm happy to include them too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and next we have Wayne Sandberg. Thank you very much. Um, respect, respect. We got to respect anybody's opinion, anybody's thoughts, anybody's gender. Uh, it's respect and inclusion. Uh, Johnson County Community, oh, first of all, uh, Johnson County Community College is Johnson County. And right now, I believe that um, the college is, uh, is uh, with its programs in DEI and, and, and uh, targeting uh, uh, kids in high school, I, I believe the student enrollment uh, is meeting uh, uh, fairly good on, on the inclusion aspects of the minorities and, and women. Um, uh, I believe we need to uh, strengthen the instructor base a little better with uh, uh, certain minorities. And, uh, but uh, what, I, what I think we ought to do is uh, just uh, uh, bring in some kind of a mentoring program where once they get through some of these technical degrees, maybe they can become instructors. We ought to target uh, uh, different bases out there a little stronger. We need to strengthen our recruiting effort to uh, uh, look after uh, uh, different aspects of, of our society that we represent. So. Um, we need to feel welcome. I don't care what, where, what, where you're from or how you talk or if you have trouble with the language or whatever, whatever you need to be welcomed. And uh, I think the programs at JCCC are, are, have been implemented and I think it's being strengthened and the DEI program is, uh, is a leader in, uh, in Kansas. And uh, I think it's one of the better ones uh, that I've seen um, pretty much in um, most of American colleges. So I, I think we need to just keep it going and uh, uh, keep strengthening it. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Now we're moving to our next question and Paul Snyder will be the first to answer this question. 
The question is, what is your understanding and definition of shared governance? And what do you believe the status of shared governance is at Johnson County Community College? Well, thank you for the question. Um, shared governance uh, to me is an avenue to where the faculty can have input into the direction of the college. Um, I, I support in principle shared governance. Uh, after all, the can't have a college obviously without um, excellent faculty and, and teachers that are going to instruct the, the students in the community. So there, there's a clear voice that needs to be there and, and present. I think the college has made strides in this, at least my past four years on the board. Um, I think there are still challenges and, and a ways to go to make it to where everyone is comfortable with um, the, the, uh, the right mix and how those decisions are made. I would argue that th there's always a pathway to including voices. Uh, I think what I hear probably most frequently from faculty members is a, a feeling that they are not being heard. And sometimes at our board meetings during faculty updates, it appears to me that maybe some of those, those remarks are being directed at the administration and we're just, you know, a, a filter to, or a, a, a hearing those at the same time as, as Dr. Bound. So I, I think there's always opportunities to improve communication between faculty and the cabinet and, and even the trustees, but I do respect the administration's role to interact primarily with the faculty. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Moyer. Thank you. Um, well, with everything that we're being asked tonight, I want to keep in the back of my mind what the main goal of the college is. And I know I've said this before, but I believe that goal is to provide everyone who wants and needs one with a quality education. Um, and part of this, when it comes to shared governance, is making sure that the professionals and the experts are the ones who are driving the college. And I believe that the faculty um, and, and the, the teachers, they're the, they're the front line of defense when it comes to education. They're the ones who are in the classroom day in and day out, making sure that the students who enroll at Johnson County Community College are provided with that quality education that I'm talking about. Um, so I would find every avenue possible if elected as trustee to make sure that um, that faculty are um, heard and they're respected and to make sure that um, we are doing our role at the college, but that we are also taking into account what the faculty needs and what the teachers in the classrooms need um, to make sure they can do the best job that they absolutely can. Thank you. Next, we have Dawn Rattan. So I'll admit that I am just learning about shared governance. And so I do like I always do when I um, am encountered with a new concept and that's go and ask questions. And so what I've done is meet with faculty association president, Mr. Liker, and I've met with um, um, the academic um, officer, chief academic officer, Mickey McLeod, and I asked him that question to ask, um, you know, two different sides of what is shared governance and, and got some points on that. And what I'm realizing is the college is working towards de defining for our specific college what that looks like. And so there was a May 1 report um, by the Higher Learning Commission that was due to the Higher Learning Commission. And it had to talk, and it talked about some gaps that we had in shared governance. Um, it talked about communication processes, protocols, and et cetera. And that led to two committees being established, the Academic Branch uh, Council and the Institutional Shared Governance Task Force. They both gave some reports um, and they're still, like I said, I think I feel like at the college, we're still trying to define what that looks like to get to a point where everyone is happy with it. But I, I do feel like the college is defining it and learning how we really do shared governance the right way for Johnson County Community College, where it makes sense, all impacted groups should share in key decision making. It's gonna create a better overall outcome. We share in the goal for doing what's right for students and instructors are the face to face daily that knows what's going on in our college. Their feet are on the ground. And so we need to include them. And this again, becomes all of our success when we know how to do shared governance correctly. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Gary Malnar. Thank you. Um, I mean, shared governance is really about partnership, mutual respect, and uh, what's required of that to be successful as well is to be having open channels of communication between what's happening in the classroom uh, from our faculty to inform the decisions that are being made for the college. Uh, these are uh, practiced uh, educators uh, who can provide some, some very meaningful impact uh, and, and inputs uh, and suggestions as to where we uh, could potentially take the college, where they're, they're seeing uh, gaps uh, that we could potentially close. But it, it really boils down to having a good partnership between those decision-making bodies uh, in order to make uh, decisions that affect our, our stakeholders, which are not only the faculty, but also the students and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Joy Coaston. Thank you for the question. Uh, you know, studies have shown for decades now that organizations who bring all stakeholders to the table are stronger, uh, more uh, adept at changing with the times and more inclusive. And I think that <clears throat> colleges are in the same boat when we think about uh, shared governance. Uh, we can see just in this past year and a half as COVID hit, uh, those or educational uh, organizations that uh, came together and talked to all stakeholders were able to adapt to, to the crisis uh, in the best way. Uh, as, as far as um, what is the current status at the college, I can only speak from my own experience. And I will say that my experience is a few, is a few years old. I retired from teaching uh, a couple of years ago, but when I was an adjunct faculty member at the college, um, I know the adjunct faculty often felt that there's, their voices weren't being heard. Uh, and I suspect that other tenure track faculty often feel that they're cast aside uh, in, in uh, an effort to have some kind of top-down uh, decision-making process. So I think it is really incumbent on all of the trustees and, and the leadership at the college to make sure that all, all of the stakeholders, faculty of all sorts, stakeholders of other types, community leaders, community business owners, to have some say in what the outcomes of the college need to be for the future. Um, so again, I think um, just having that sense of ownership and responsibility, making sure that we have uh, a wide variety of voices at the table just makes every organization stronger. And I believe that that would be the case with the college. Thank you. Next, we have Wayne Sandberg. Thank you. Um, I spoke with uh, President Bone, and uh, uh, he he uh, he he and his staff welcomes communication and inclusiveness of all parties to bring to him their ideas and direction for the uh, the college for its future. Now we have students that need a voice, they have a voice. We have a staff, we have faculty. Um, we got the citizens of the county uh, and uh, we have employers, workforce development. As I said before, with uh, uh, Edgerton and uh, everything going on in this county, we're about ready to explode. I mean, this county is gonna increase in population and workforce like you wouldn't believe. So there's got to be a little bit of input from uh, businesses. And, uh, and the nice thing about the trustees, uh, we're a little diverse, we'd be diversified there with our inputs on that. But ultimately, Dr. Bone can take what we give him and, uh, and form a better college for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lee Cross. Professor, would you mind repeating the question? Absolutely. Sorry. Is, what is your understanding and definition of shared governance 
and what do you believe the status of shared governance is at Johnson County Community College? Yes, thank you again for that, and I appreciate all the answers. I, I do think it is mutual understanding and respect. Uh, I will say that quite candidly, it was an immense source of stress with a previous president and I just having a basic understanding of what it meant to have stakeholders come together, talk, and let them have input. So a key part of due process is notice of something and the opportunity to be heard. And I think um, the AAUP's definition essentially states that it's a call to a mutual understanding regarding the government of colleges and universities, understanding based on the community of interest and producing joint effort is essential for three reasons. And it goes into, especially in a state school where you have all of the different political bodies involved, uh, legislative, local, uh, plus the funds from students. And second, the regard for welfare of the institution remains important despite the mobility and interchange of scholars. And third, a college or university which, in which all components are aware of their interdependence, of the usefulness of communication among themselves and the force of joint action will enjoy increased capacity to solve educational problems. I think just as Dr. Koston suggested. And so I, I've worked to do that in my time. Uh, I've had really a, a, a tremendous uh, opportunity here serving as trustee, protecting due process in 2016, uh, getting that uh, for the first time ever implemented into our master agreement. Uh, and I think to answer the question about the status, I think it's a constant strain. I'm, I'm encouraged by uh, the committees that we have formed now, uh, but sometimes I wonder if they're just uh, for appearance, but I think in my time as trustee, simply having relationships with the stakeholders and knowing uh, to go to them or seek their input, I, I think is critical. I've seen a series of FA presidents just stymied by a cabinet that didn't wanna even deal with certain issues. And I think that our cabinet's in a much different place now. I, I will say without blowing smoke, and I think the crowd understands my um, personal preferences, but the FA is a big driver of campus policy and the organization that they have as a union drives the increase in wages for the FA themselves, the adjunct, and even the staff on the college. And I'd like to see, and I, I, I frankly tried uh, to organize the adjunct faculty. I was at, within Cincinnati when the University of Cincinnati adjunct were organizing in 2003 and four. And I think we need to do that now. And there's colleges uh, across the country that have several unions on campus. And so I think that's critical for the leverage and frankly, the negotiation position that they need to get what we need from the administration. Thank you. Now moving on to our next question. And the first person to answer this question will be Jerry Molnar. The question is, many students, especially first generation students can find college difficult to navigate. What do you think about the current Johnson County Community College mentoring and support programs for struggling students? Well, I think they've got a, a number of programs uh, that are, are there put in place, like the, the CLEAR program, for example, I think it's a, a hallmark of uh, that effort uh, to help students that, that have learning challenges. Uh, beyond that, I don't have much other uh, understanding of what else the college is doing right now in that space. Thank you. Next, we have Wayne Sandberg. Well, uh, the college, uh, I've, I've um, I moved to um, Blue Valley School District in the early 80s when 119th Street was a gravel road. And I grew, uh, my, my family and I grew with uh, Johnson County Community College. And my neighbor is a, was a, uh, is still, a major uh, uh, player at the college in uh, in um, that area. Uh, the college does an excellent job. It, well, once again, it, it always can get better, but uh, the college uh, I feel is a, a leader in that kind of uh, um, help for students that are disadvantaged in that. Now, mentoring, uh, uh, if they're uh, kids that are getting scholarships and that, uh, part of their give back could be to 
when they get their education is to give back and possibly help mentor or or study groups or whatever else that things like that could be tweaked a little bit so that's about it thank you thank you next we have lee cross i'm sorry to do this what, what was the question again absolutely many students especially first generation students can find college difficult to navigate what do you think about the current Johnson County Community College mentoring and support programs for struggling students? Well, thank you, Professor, for the question. Um, I think at a minimum, we need more full-time faculty. I think the reality has been our enrollment is down and that has stymied our ability to uh, get the money or have more full-time faculty. So I think at a minimum, we need more counselors and full-time faculty. That'll provide the basics of some wayfinding in the in the interpersonal relationships beyond the internet or simply signs on a board. Um, I, I think the the all the things we're doing with respect to food are important. I think um, we're doing more with respect to veterans groups so that veterans can see peers and help each other um, through PTSD or any number of, of shared experiences that they have. And I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, in the international club or any of our, our clubs, and we had a student last week, Trustee Snyder could attest to this, that uh, talked about how she felt welcome and um, a part of campus life because we went out of our way to, uh, I think she was uh, from Nepal, the student, I forget her name, but uh, she felt welcome and included. And I think, you know, she's probably a socialite and someone that went and found the way, and that's good. And so it's just a matter of, I think, educating people what we're already doing. That's something we're struggling with against for-profit schools in, in my time on the board. Telling them what we have, telling them what we're doing, and then making sure we can get as many people as possible involved. But again, I think that goes back to the organizing that professors or full-time faculty help us do. And then as full-time faculty, they're there to help steer the students in the right direction. They know campus and they have the relationship is in the community to guide our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Joy Coaston. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll just frame my, my comments this way in that uh, I, I was not the first person in my family to go to college. My mother was. Um, and my husband, though, was the first person in his family to go to college. And my son-in-law, was also the first person in his family to go to college. Um, I can't attest to my husband's experience, but I know my son-in-law's experience as an older adult learner was um, that he was overwhelmed by the experience of being in college uh, for the first time because he had no role model uh, or really support system other than my daughter and us uh, to help him navigate what that college experience should be like. Um, and so in that sense, um, when I think about students coming into um, any college situation, uh, the teachers certainly know uh, firsthand what their students are struggling with. Hopefully counselors know what they're struggling with too, but that really leaves the burden on the student to seek out that kind of help, whether with the, their, their professor or an instructor or to seek help with the counseling service. Um, I gotta say that in the last five minutes as other people were talking. I actually went to the Johnson County Community College website and looked up what kind of resources you have for first time learners or first time students. And I did not see anything on the website that specifically drills down uh, to that kind of help. So if our intent is to really um, make that ladder available, that life jacket available to first time learners, first time college students, then we need to make it really accessible for them to find the mentor port programs and the counseling programs that they need so that they have the, the information and knowledge. Um, so I think that there's still a lot of work to, to do in this uh, arena. I do agree with uh, Trustee Cross that we, we really do need to make sure that we have um, the staff available, both the counseling staff and the faculty support to um, have the resources necessary to, to help uh, first-generation learners or perhaps learners coming back from 
the military. I did see the military programs on your website. Um, but I do think that there's always there are always opportunities for really expanding that visibility so that we're ready to help students as they enter the college uh, wherever they are. Thank you, Joy. Next, we have Jay Moyer. Thank you. Well, um, I'll kind of take this time to speak as a student of the college myself. Um, I'm a non-traditional student, but whether you are non-traditional or a first-time student walking into Johnson County Community College right out of high school, um, I would agree um, with two of the former speakers that one of the most incredible resources at the college is the counseling department. I want to take this moment to kind of uplift them and, and point them out because as a student, time and time again, I've used that resource to figure out exactly which classes I need to be taking exactly what I need to be doing at Johnson County Community College to further my education and to figure out what I want to do in life. And then after that counseling department, I think it's incredible that the college has so many different resources for students to get involved with, um, whether that's the CLEAR program, helping students with um, disabilities, or the, the PAVE program, helping veterans, um, even just on-campus activities to get first-time students involved or non-traditional students. Um, such as our award-winning debate program or um, the award-winning cheerleading program that's and dance program that's on campus. Um, there's also, I had the pleasure of going and um, uh, visiting the Harvest Dinner a few nights ago um, uh, at the wonderful pleasure of the hosts, the Sustainable Agriculture Program. Um, so I think um, Johnson County Community College needs to focus on making sure that that support system for students, that counseling department, and then making sure we also have a plethora of programs to put students into to help them find out what their passion is in life. Those are the most important things. And I, I think um, if we need more staff in the counseling department, I'm not sure if, if that's an issue, but if that is an issue, then we need to make sure that we're addressing that. But I think that focusing on that and leaning on, on those separate programs just outside of general education as well, are um, very, very important and they enhance the um, quality education that are going to prepare students for the next economy. Thank you. Next we have Paul Snyder. If you are a student that is uh, new to college, maybe the first in your family or wondering you know, how you're gonna pay for college or, or uh, might be getting overwhelmed, Johnson County Community College is the place that you need to be. Uh, at, at the get-go, we have student success ambassadors that are going to help you get enrolled, make sure you find your classes, know where to go. Uh, certainly, we have a backstop of counselors that can work with you every step of the way to make sure that you're in the appropriate classes. And we have an excellent financial aid department as well. But there are other attributes to Johnson County Community College that, that make everything work. In particular, uh, Dr. Randy Weber uh, is an executive vice president of Success Services, and that's been a big priority for the board. Uh, Dr. Weber has been working on this program the last four or five years, at least it predated uh, my election to the board in 2017. And he is implicitly focused on trying to make sure that students that come to the college succeed at the college. And so that, that is great. Our college is also of a size that if a, a student is struggling, someone will see it. Every time you're on campus, you might see a, a student or a visitor kind of, they get that little bit of a look and hesitation. Don't, they don't know where they go. A staff member almost always uh, will go up to them and say, I see you might be having some difficulty. You need help finding something. So that, that's something that's special about the college. Dr. Bound and other members of the cabinet recognize students, will check in on them. Uh, and then part of our success program uh, is also looking at different metrics. If a student enrolls in a class, but then doesn't show up, uh, someone will call that student and make sure, uh, just check in. Do they need someone to talk to? Do they have concerns? Do they not have their books? Kind of work through that situation with them. And then as part of our facilities master plan, we rearranged all the learning centers and tutoring centers on campus, took them from several separate buildings down uh, to the main floor of the, the Billington Library. So now it's basically a one-stop shopping for anyone that needs tutoring. Uh, so if it needs math and they also have an English class, they're in the same location and can get those services. So this has been a big, big priority for the college. We're also looking at things. Uh, do people know how to enroll? Do they know what the bursar's office is? Do we just have language barriers that people don't understand? And we've got a board now and cabinet that are looking at those uh, areas and where we can find improvement. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we have Dawn Rattan. Uh, so I'll say that when I went to college, uh, I did chemical engineering, and there were times when I'd be caught up crying and thinking that I wasn't going to make it through. Um, it was a big endeavor. I was in my family, and luckily I had my uh, boyfriend and my husband there to comfort me, but everyone doesn't have this um, support system, or sometimes they need a little bit more. So I definitely think that we can always increase our support services for students that are struggling. Um, so I would say that I did see on Facebook that the community college had something called a success team and there were four or five people standing outside and they posted that a couple of times about a week before school started. And I'm not sure who all the people were in the components of that, but I'm pretty sure there were some, some counselors and some other um, resources there. There were about four or five people listed. Um, and then yesterday um, at Cavs kickoff, um, I was really delighted. I, I talked to someone who was um, part of the mental health club and I took her card and I'd love to get more information from her. There was a black student union. There was a PAVE uh, group for veterans and that representative was so um, passionate about helping veterans. There was even a, a Bollywood club. Um, there were about three religious organizations there. And um, so I think that there are a lot of uh, resources there for the students, but again, we can always do better. I know there are also some resources for some people who are neuro, neurodivergent. Um, and then uh, I would love to, I've talked to uh, Professor Krug about expanding the mental health support for students. Um, I know there are classes for students to catch up if they need to, clothing and um, a, the, and I took the tour and saw that all the tutoring centers had gotten co-located and then the clothing and food pantry. Um, and I also finally think that um, the faculty senses and reaches out when they see that. I think the faculty is very in tune to the student um, success and students that struggled. And again, I had a few teachers when I went to school that might've saw that I was struggling and reached out to me. Um, and then also finally in Procter & Gamble, we had um, a black managers group that when I came in, they talked to me about some subtleties of corporate America that I wouldn't have gotten from my parents who had GEDs. And so I think that all these groups are all, it's a both and, it's not an either or. They all come together to help ensure uh, from different approaches that a student can be successful. They're all needed and they're all worthwhile. Thank you. Next, we're moving to our next question. And the first person to answer this question will be Jay Moyer. And the question is, what have you learned about adjunct faculty and their unique needs for inclusion with equity at Johnson County Community College? Well, um, I have a great respect, great deal of respect for the adjunct faculty. Um, I believe that they provide just as quality in education as everyone else at the college, um, all the full-time faculty rather. Um, I believe that there is a necessity for diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. Um, the report showed that um, the faculty in general found that there is more of a necessity for action taken in regards to things regarding um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I want to make sure that whatever those needs are, whatever those, um, those things are that need to be addressed, that we're addressing them. Um, I will need to do a little bit more research into whether or not there's anything specific to the adjunct faculty. Um, but if elected, I will absolutely be someone, and even as a candidate, I will absolutely be someone who will be looking out for that and listening for those types of things. And I want to make sure that everyone feels included and welcome on campus. Thank you. Next, we have Joy Coaston. Thank you. Um, so from my own experience as an adjunct faculty member on several different college campuses, I can tell that there are um, group, each, each department includes adjunct in a different way. And sometimes that can be very uh, inviting and warm and welcoming. And other times uh, you're really just a hired hand. Um, and I, I know that my time at Johnson County Community College was always one of feeling like I was included and that the people that I worked with, the colleagues that I had in the department were welcoming, not only of my, uh, the skills that I brought to the, to the classroom, but also to the research background that I had. So I think that it's really, again, uh, incumbent on 
all of the faculty within the within the organization to think about how they could make the adjunct faculty feel more like part of the process. Uh, and certainly um, having an adjunct uh, pool, which is really a very large group of people at every university now, it's, it's uh, typically the majority of, of the uh, employees that you have in the teaching pool. Um, it's important that we, we think about how do we include them? How do we make sure that they fairly represent the community at large? And how is it that, uh, that they have the skills and, and the ability to teach the classes that we need them to teach? One of the great benefits of an adjunct uh, model is that as your courses change and as you, the needs of the university and colleges change, uh, then you have the opportunity to be a little bit more flexible about how you uh, kind of deploy those resources. Um, but there's no question that uh, sometimes adjunct faculty can be uh, can feel very marginalized uh, by uh, the rest of the college institution just because um, they're not there physically day in and day out. They come and they go. They teach their classes. Uh, they typically uh, aren't aren't uh, included in a lot of decision making that goes on. And so um, I think that it's just really an important part of uh, making sure that everyone within that faculty staff uh, or that faculty pool feel like they're part of the organization uh, and aren't too burdened to, uh, to teach at the, at the college. I happen to know some, some colleagues who uh, would teach at five different community colleges just to make uh, a full load of coursework. And, and that's a challenge when you can't get benefits, you can't get a good pay, um, so I think we really do have to pay attention to how adjunct are included and uh, making sure that they have some equity when they come to the table. Thank you. Next, we have Dawn Rattan. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Joy. Um, actually, uh, she's taught me a lot about um, working as an adjunct professor and shared some of her experience that she just talked about there. So thank you for that. I'm also glad that um, for the shared governance committee on the for the academic branch committee that they did add a representation, a representative from the um, adjunct faculty to make sure that their voice is heard. Um, what I've learned from about adjunct adjunct faculty is there's no less dedication or quality instruction when they're adjunct. In fact, um, Jay, as a student, has said that they don't even realize if they have an adjunct or, or full-time uh, faculty member as we've had conversations about it. Um, and I also know that recruiting for certain instructors is quite difficult to find part-time, to find full-time. And so sometimes you've got to go with an adjunct uh, faculty member in order to teach that certain curriculum. Um, and it also helps our college stay flexible. We can meet the changing needs of the industry and educational needs by adding adjunct pretty quickly, but we've got to make sure that they've got the resources they need and whether that's a living wage, benefits, laptop, um, resources, support, and inclusion. So we've got to take that into account as we stay flexible, but also take care of these faculty who are in turn taking care of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lee Cross. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the question and, and all the answers. Uh, I will have to say that I probably agree with uh, Dr. Koston uh, on, on a number of her comments. And the only thing I would tweak is that they're, they're absolutely invaluable. Uh, they're marginalized and, and frankly exploited. And so the whole system of higher ed, not picking on Johnson County Community College, but um, the whole system of higher ed right now is based off balancing the backs of uh, balancing budgets off the backs of unorganized labor. And I think it's critical that we have more full time faculty. It, it, it's something I've said for eight, almost nine years now. So it's not something new that I'm bringing to this organization tonight. Uh, but the, the, the adjunct faculty are sold as people who have business experience and, and real world experience to offer our students. And that's true, but it's one of exploitation. And so, you know, as an independent thinker, I'm happy to just be the one to say it and be critical. So uh, I will say that they, they do need a union. Uh, our, the, one of the music, musical performers at our church is an adjunct faculty member. And I've talked to him about organizing uh, the adjunct, and um, I think it needs to happen. 
And I'll tell you that when Trusty Lawson showed up and we could get seconds on votes and then Trusty Smith Everett showed up and we could get, uh, you know, make a run at, at, at the majority and you know, hopefully swinging a couple of the other trustees, it, it was helpful to have allies on the board. So I think having allies on the board and uh, working toward these issues to bring them a better working environment, because I think people can teach better if they're not literally running around to the three, four, five jobs, like Dr. Koston says. And there's been a lot of write-ups, journalism on this topic. I would invite everyone to go read about it. Uh, and then a lot of times they don't even have health care. I think Dr. Koston may have said that, but it's a critical issue. And so I think I want world-class students. And to do that, I think we need world-class staff and faculty. And I don't want them stressed out, like literally worried about where they're going to get health care. So uh, thank you for the question. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Snyder. Hey, would you mind repeating the question so I make sure I give you the answer you're looking for? Yes. What have you learned about adjunct faculty and their unique needs for inclusion with equity at Johnson County Community College? Thank you for that. Well, I, adjunct faculty are, are a, a key, key part of our, our teaching infrastructure at the college. Uh, we have roughly 325 full-time faculty that make up our faculty um, union, or at least are under that, that union contract, but we have 475 part-time faculty. So clearly they are, they are a very integral part of what we're trying to do. We've always prided ourselves in getting excellent um, adjuncts to come and be a part of our, our college. And so I appreciate the efforts there. I think one of the advantages of, of adjuncts is the flexibility, but more so than that, I think they do are able to give uh, their students real world perspective since they're integrated into the workforce right now. Um, with that though, we do have challenges recruiting some adjunct faculty because they're in, in careers that, that may um, pay them much more than they're willing uh, for the time and they're willing to devote to the community college or simply they are just not available from a uh, a workload standpoint to try to try to do that. I know uh, our chief academic officer was just relaying some challenges he had uh, recruiting some some adjuncts um, to to meet our growing interest in enrollment for this year. So it's absolutely vital that that they are part of our college. And I am aware that they haven't had the same voice uh, as regular faculty. And I think we are 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 recognizing that and trying to take steps to to remedy that. One of the ways we're doing that is through the, the new college council. Uh, there are our adjunct slots um, put on that council so we can hear those perspectives and certainly um, other forms that we can, that those adjunct faculties can reach out to decision makers. Uh, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you. Next is Wayne Sandberg. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, the future of the college is uh, is, uh, is is adjunct professors. Uh, they they uh, the niches that they provide are niches that the workforce uh, needs, and these people are 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 a vital clog, uh, clog in that in that development. Uh, we need them more than anything now. In higher education, I, I think that we need more uh, full-time professors, but uh, in the uh, continuing education and in the technology part, I think uh, the college needs to go out to uh, to uh, the, um, companies and, uh, and, and have them help provide uh, a give back to the uh, school to develop more people to feed them to feed their needs. Like I said before, we're about ready to explode in this county because uh, we're only one of two uh, places in the United States that uh, service the world with the containers and, and stuff like that. So there's gonna be an incredible amount of need for more uh, uh, professors uh, or teachers in uh, technology sectors. and. And uh, Johnson County is going to be a leader in that. That said, they can. Uh, it's a it's a uh, ground and and to for advancement. And uh, let's treat it like a business. You know, if you find a good professor, 
make him a full-time professor. I mean, that's what uh, we pay uh, the staff and Dr. Bone for, you know, they, they can uh, they can analyze who, who uh, should be uh, moving on or, or not, you know. I mean, I'm not a politician, so I'm a businessman, I told him. You know, anyway, that's, that's my thought on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Jerry Molnar. Thank you. I actually uh, was an adjunct professor at uh, St. Louis University uh, for uh, family and community medicine and followed up with that. I was adjunct at uh, Washington University uh, for which was pretty much the bulk of my private practice experience. And uh, that really, uh, how it benefited the student was they got some really practical learning uh, from someone who is doing the craft. Uh, that's, that's the difference between being an academic uh, physician versus a practicing physician. Of course, I went on from there because I liked the teaching aspect and ended up becoming a faculty member at UMKC. So I, I see the benefit that, that adjuncts bring, but I was out there doing my own thing, didn't have a voice uh, when it came to uh, what was going on with regards to the university. Uh, and I think that that's probably similar to uh, what I'm hearing that's happening at Johnson County Community College. They're a valued asset. I had a good friend of mine that, that taught uh, a specialized course at the Block Business School. Uh, so they can really kind of expand the, the offerings, but it's important that those individuals have some representation. So getting back to that conversation we were having earlier around shared governance, I think it's incumbent upon the, the organization to figure out ways to get them uh, to the table so that they feel represented and heard. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question before our final statements. So the first person to answer this question will be Don Rattan. And the question is, should the budget bill pass funding for free community college? Name one impact you predict that the new policy would have on Johnson County Community College and identify one specific action the board should take to prepare the college. Can you repeat that one more time? Absolutely, it's a long one. Mm -hmm. Should the budget bill pass funding free community college, name one impact you predict that the new policy would have on Johnson County Community College and identify one specific action the board should take to prepare the college? Oh, great question. So, um, yeah, I um, am looking at the, for the free community college. I actually went to school free of charge on an academic scholarship to get a degree in chemical engineering. And um, I met with um, the mayor of Overland Park and we talked a little bit about a free college and um, there was some discussion about what, what does that do to the taxpayers who are already paying a mill levy to support the tax? What does that do to the foundation? So those are things that we've got to figure out. But what I think um, that we should do is, um, like when we talk about the Kansas Promise, there's some skin in the game and that the um, students have to stay for two more years and give back to Kansas. And so um, when we talk about free college, I definitely think there should be some kind of skin in the game and it may not be monetary. So for me, I had to maintain a 3.0 all the years that I was there. So as we talk about free college, let's talk about non-monetary ways that students still have some skin in the game and they still have to contribute, whether that's a community service or making a certain GPA, staying in Kansas for two more years. So if, I don't know if um, when the budget passes for, when or if it passes for free college, if we have that flexibility, but that's the work that I would start looking at at our college and get creative on um, making sure that um, it's just not a free for all and that um, students understand the value of this and um, work on the structure of how that would work or there's certain ways that um, if, if it's given to all, are there certain funding structures? Uh, is the free college sponsored by certain companies? I know mine was partially funded by Pfizer. Uh, so I just think really start to think about how to make it free. What's the impact on the taxpayers? 
How does it affect the reserves, uh, which we have about nine months of? How does it affect the foundation? So all of those pieces of puzzle are gonna have to come together and have a discussion. Thank you. Next, we have Lee Cross. And one more time with the question, if I may, Professor Easley. Yes. The question is, <laughs> should the budget bill pass funding for free community college? Name one impact you predict that the new policy would have on Johnson County Community College and identify one specific action the board should take to prepare the college. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the bill did pass. I think the governor was on campus last week and signed it. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. I know uh, I campaigned on it. I assume Trustee Lawson did uh, four years ago for free community college. I think uh, Senator Bernie Sanders had campaigned on it in 15 and 16. So. I'm not claiming it as an original idea. I stole it from him and there's various groups that have supported it. So I am proud to have helped promote that and uh, help usher in the allies we needed in the legislature and to Cedar Crest to get that done. Uh, one impact I think it'll have is that I think it'll give <clears throat> more access to more people uh, for community college. Uh, the goal that Senator Baumgartner, Senator T uh, Tom Holland, a friend of mine, and uh, the governor uh, touted was that only about 35% of our students fill out the FAFSA. And we're working to get that number up. So I think the impact we'll see is that more people will simply apply for financial aid. I think that's good and uh, give greater access to higher education. Uh, the impact I think we'll see, I mean, Trustee Snyder and I are liaisons to the foundation executive board. Uh, and we had, and to Trustee Snyder's credit and the rest of my colleagues, we had pushed this prior uh, to passage in the legislature and to do it through essentially private means. And I'd like to continue seeing us doing that, making it a last dollar program with certain uh, requirements for merit-based um, performance. And uh, honestly, I, as, as a lawyer, I'm not sure the restriction on uh, travel is constitutional. I understand it what Kansas is trying to do as a market participant to encourage people to stay here. I'm a lifelong Kansan, a seventh generation Johnson Countyan, and I, I'd love to have people stay here. I really would. But I think um, we should do that on our own merit. I think that we should work to facilitate as many people as possible to have access to it. So, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Wayne Sandberg. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we're going to see uh, if that thing passes, you're going to see uh, the college uh, uh, enrollment increase. Uh, we'll see more participation by companies sending uh, employees to the college to get uh, uh, higher education or specialty education. Uh, we'll see a lot of benefits uh, coming in uh, if this thing passes. Now, what do we need to do right now? And uh, this is uh, my pretty much my platform is uh, Johnson County has uh, uh, population has increased uh, almost double in the last 20 years where the college has uh, maintained just a steady enrollment or a small decrease. Um, uh, we have, we're being invaded by uh, colleges from Kansas and all over uh, into Johnson County, uh, taking away uh, some of the rights of a junior, of a uh, community college. So we need uh, to get ready for this we need to budget a lot more in the recruiting staff of the college to go out and find very quality students or go to businesses and really recruit, recruit, recruit. I see this college uh, increasing enrollment, which is gonna help all the professors increase wages, It'll help. Uh, it'll help the the arts. The arts will be better for all the people in Johnson County. Everything will be better if we can increase the enrollment. We need 
to budget three, four fold into the recruiting effort. That's the key. We need to find uh, uh, students that, uh, uh, modern students, we need to have a, a world-class uh, esports program. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Next we have Paul Snyder. I'm going to assume that this question is related to the federal reconciliation bill and, and the prospect of federal federally funded free college. I, I think the, the biggest impact of that is that it opens the door to just numerous, numerous questions about how it would work. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Don said and, and hope that as if that moves forward, that we are afforded uh, some flexibility to tailor programs that are going to be um, most advantageous to not only our students, but the community. I, I do think one of the common concerns with, with free college is that it, it dilutes the value somewhat and that if people don't have some sort of personal investment, uh, either they won't take it seriously or won't, won't have the same initiative um, to work through a program. So that's something that we always need to, to leverage. The College Promise Act at Kansas that just passed is tailored to, to specific programs, five of them in particular that are our current workforce needs. That is one of the questions, whether a federal program would do something similar and really tie it to, to local workforce needs. In any event, I think one of the things that, that the board would want to do, number one, what we need to try to match our available faculty to with whatever the enrollment is going to be. But more than so than that is we need to strengthen ties with the business community to make sure that we are offering programs that align with, with their particular needs. One other big looming question is if the federal government would just be reimbursing um, colleges for the, the tuition paid by students, in which case would that necessitate increasing our tuition? For instance, if the federal government's going to reimburse colleges up to $150 per credit hour, would we start to, to try to get in that game of matching that to maximize federal dollars? So a lot of questions at the end of the day. You. Next, we have Jerry Molnar. Yeah, I think uh, certainly nothing is free. And uh, uh, just to dovetail off Paul's comments, um, I, when you have the feds getting in the middle of stuff like this, uh, I would anticipate, and what I've heard is we'll probably have more regulation. So uh, that'll compete with uh, the academic uh, aims of, of the college. Uh, it'll also you know, have probably restrictions uh, or uh, expectations around enrollment and graduation uh, rates. And so uh, e I think even the current governor is, is having some, uh, doing some hand wringing over this one uh, because of those kinds of things. And I think that's, that's what I fear the most when you get uh, the federal government involved in this is we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with other regulation that oftentimes will get in the way of the academic mission of the school. Uh, so so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that, that we don't see that come. Because uh, again, uh, as many have stated, I mean, everybody has to have some investment uh, in, in this enterprise as a student in order to see its value. Uh, and so, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Joy Coaston. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I agree with so many things that uh, several people have said, but I'll tell you that if the Biden proposal uh, comes to fruition, I'll be all for it. I do think that um, with any incentive, whether it's a federal government incentive or a state government incentive, there should be guardrails uh, or clawbacks of some sort that make sure that the money is spent in a way that uh, truly does support student success and that students feel that there is some ownership of what they are getting uh, in return. The biggest challenge that we face as an institution will certainly be to ensure that we recruit, recognize and retain the best teachers in the region. And that includes the adjunct faculty. And I think that if we're going to do that, then we certainly can hopefully put some of those dollars towards recruitment, retention, and recognition of the teacher of our teaching staff. Um, I think the federal funds will allow us the ability to do that. 
I also think that we could beef up our uh, relationships with the uh, business community. And I think Mr. Sandberg brought that to, to the front where we, he really uh, talked about making sure that we have those uh, relationships with business communities and we have uh, kind of ambassadors for the college to make sure that we know what's the, what are those uh, just-in-time training needs that businesses need. I know we do that a lot with the Business and Industry Institute and other initiatives but it certainly is important that we continue to have transparency about what kind of jobs students can expect to have after they complete their work at JCCC and that we fulfill, we, we prepare the, the students uh, for those jobs in a very clear way. So all in all, I think these initiatives will help the college provide world-class education to build a world-class workforce in our community. And I would be very excited to see that happen uh, in our community. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Moyer. Okay, well, I am also very excited about this plan. You know, as a student at the community college, um, I understand that rates are affordable, but I have also seen um, classmates of mine not be able to complete their courses due to the burdens of life and some of those hardships, um, which is why I'm very excited about this plan. I think financially, one thing that we could do is we could look at ways to shore up the budget. Um, and what that means um, monetarily for the college, as well as the community, as well as Johnson County. Um, and we can also capitalize on this opportunity and strengthen relationships with local small businesses um, so that they have a way to prepare. Um, and also so that we have a way to prepare for, an, for a potential influx of students. I, I do think this would be a way to um, raise enrollment at Johnson County Community College. Um, but with higher enrollment and more businesses coming to Johnson County because we are able to provide that quality education to a greater number of people. Um, I also believe that um, businesses would offer more internships and internships turn into jobs and um, jobs turn into um, more input for our economy here in Johnson County. Um, I also think that a really important part of this is making sure that the staff is prepared. The, um, both the full-time faculty and the adjunct faculty. I think that we need to use whatever resources we have to make sure um, that with a potential influx that we are able to um, prepare them so that they are preparing students um, for whatever comes next in our economy. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging with us. It was important, I thought, to get one more or last question. I know we're running a little over time, but we're gonna move to final statements now. Each candidate will have one minute to make their final statement, and we will begin with Wayne Sandberg. Well, thank you, uh, 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 Johnson County Community College uh, professors uh, uh, and uh, League of Women Voters of Johnson County and, and all faculty and uh, staff at Johnson County. Thank you very much. Um, I want your vote, um, but whether I get elected or not, uh, I, I'm a big believer in Johnson County, and I uh, uh, we've been a leader uh, since the 80s, 70s, 70s, 80s, 80s, and uh, we're going to continue to be in the leader. Now, I'm a big believer. If, if the way it's been is, if you build it, they'll come. That won't work anymore. Uh, the, we have to have a new model. We need to beef up our recruiting and recruiting of quality uh, uh, students and, and, and we need uh, recruiting of businesses to get their undereducated or, or staff that needs uh, uh, more help in, uh, in developing their businesses. Uh, Johnson County is about ready to uh, increase uh, big time, and uh, I think our enrollment is uh, got to be ready. Our, our, um, uh, we need to recruit the best uh, professors, adjunct or, or full time. We need to combat this, all these uh, four year colleges coming into our area. We need to uh, beef it up so. Uh, uh, they use uh, Johnson County Community College rather than uh, these out-of-state, in-state uh, people coming and taking our students. So, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, and thank you again. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jerry Malnar. Thank you, uh, Faculty Association and uh, League of Women Voters uh, for this opportunity. 
Um, as a physician and an educator, uh, I think I'll, I, I can bring some unique insights into, in particular, the healthcare programs. We are going to experience uh, a, a, a steady decline in the number of nurses that are uh, working in the clinical space, uh, up, up to about 500,000 by, by uh, 2030. And so uh, there's opportunities there uh, for us to grow those programs. And given my background, I can certainly help that along. Uh, but also as a, a, a businessman uh, uh, working for a, a large corporation, I can bring some, also some insights uh, into what's going on with your CE programs, uh, in particular uh, with the trades programs. I think there's lots of opportunities to build partnerships uh, uh, with local businesses uh, to grow uh, some programs there. One in particular, I know waste management, met a gentleman from them, uh, from that company on us knocking on doors. Uh, first question he asked if they had a diesel program because we have 100 diesel mechanic jobs that are open right now. For, and we can't find those roles. So, so those are the kind of things I think the college uh, needs to work towards. And, and I can certainly uh, advocate and, and uh, promote those kind of activities. So appreciate your uh, consideration. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Snyder. Well, thank you again, Terry and the Faculty Association and the League of Women Voters for hosting us tonight. And thank you to the other candidates for participating. I was elected in 2017 because voters believed I would represent the community well. Being a trustee at Johns County Community College is a privilege and it's a role that I've embraced. I've supported our president, both presidents actually, and I've been collaborative and a forward looking leader on the board. There's no room for politics and local service. The focus always needs to be on the students and the community. I received a 100% rating from the mainstream coalition this year and was endorsed in 2017. That shows my commitment to good governance and engagement with the community. I'll continue that in the future. I want to support our students and improve their outcomes. We need to enhance our role with workforce development. The business community is counting on us for that. And I'll continue to advocate for taxpayers that fund the college. I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Moyer. Well, I would like to also thank the Faculty Association and the League of Women Voters for hosting us here over Zoom tonight. Um, I, as a candidate and as a person, believe that representation is important. Um, that's why I'm running. I want to provide new perspectives and a new voice on the Board of Trustees. I openly identify as gay, gender nonconforming, um, and I'm a student at the community college. And um, with these perspectives, um, I believe that my platform of equality, education, and opportunity gives us the ability to get some important things done. With equality, I wanna create safe space on campus for black, brown, indigenous, and LGBTQ students um, and faculty to make sure that they feel welcome and their voices are heard. With education, I want to uplift the educators at the college and make sure that their voices are heard by creating a um, relationship climate survey and making sure that everyone feels like they have a voice at Johnson County Community College and that their issues are important to us. And also with opportunity, I wanna make sure we're removing every single barrier possible to make sure that folks get an education. And I believe if we do these things, then we can make sure that people are getting a quality education that will take Johnson County and Johnson County Community College alumnus into the next economy. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lee Cross. Thank you, uh, Professor, and thank you to the Faculty Association and the League of Women Voters for having us tonight and for everyone's interest in uh, Johnson County Community College. I do agree with Trustee Snyder that our students uh, should come first uh, and last all the times in, in our decision making. And so I, I think that means having a world class faculty and working to build up uh, all of our employees. Uh, we've overcome a lot of challenges in the last four years. Uh, keeping Johnson County Community College affordable, expanding our school's offerings uh, during the pandemic, and even working to vaccinate uh, over, I believe, over 80% of our employees. One thing hasn't changed, and that's, that's my commitment to the college and making it the best play for Johnson County's workforce uh, so that all of our citizens can learn and earn a good job in the 21st century. I'm a proven leader. Uh, this is my third term. I've turned down a lot of opportunities and uh, the Johnson County Community 
College Fa Faculty Association and this college means a great deal to me. It helped lift my family out of poverty. And that's why I hope to have your vote on or before November 2nd. Uh, my website is crossforthecollege.com. And this year I started because of our success during the pandemic, jcccstrong.org. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Next we have Don Rattan. Uh, when I arrived at Procter & Gamble, fresh out of college in a manufacturing facility, the first thing I was tasked with doing was going to go trace all the overhead lines, find out what connect, what tank they connected to, what was in that tank and what reaction, what reacted with what. And I'll do the same thing if I'm a trustee. The first thing that I'll get in and do is learn, trace those lines, find out the connections, find out my resources, and I'll listen and learn first to find out where I fit in and where the success measures are. I've started to trace those lines by meeting with some of the key stakeholders and leaders of the community college to gather insights on how to be a good trustee. Some of the things that occur over and over again are to be fact-based, to listen, to have a heart for service and to ensure that we are stewards of the institution. Also trustees at all costs need to protect and grow our school to continue its great legacy. I would look forward to working with anyone here um, on the board and with the president to make that happen. And this college really rocks in so many ways with every conversation, every nugget of knowledge I learn about it, every article, I learned that the college really takes the word community serious, really is about the community. And I'm committing to make sure the college meets the needs of students, businesses in the future. If there's anything I can do to improve accessibility, academic success, and the opportunities after colleges, after college, I wanna be on that team and I wanna be there. I'm a wife and a mom and a business owner, but I started with as a poor kid with little resources and a big dream. And so I personally know that a college degree changed my life for the better forever. And education has the power to change a life, a family and a community. I've experienced that transformation personally and the ripple effect is what really excites me to be on this board. And so I ask you, please vote for me on November 2nd or before early voting. Uh, Rattan for trustee. Thank you very much to the League of Women Voters, to the Faculty Association, and to all the voters of Johnson County. Thank you. And next we have Joy Coaston. Thank you so much, Dr. Easley, for, for facilitating this amazing forum tonight. I'm very, very proud to be here tonight with all of these people who have chosen to run. Um, I decided to run for office in 2015 because I believed in public education at all levels, knowing that education is indeed the foundation of our society. Having served over the past 25 years in higher education, I know that students today are entering a global world of work, one that will demand much of them and challenge them in ways unlike any generation before. In this global world of work, they will compete with the best and the brightest, no matter what path they take. A recent report from the World Economic Forum highlighted how the recent pandemic and other factors have created a highly uncertain outlook for the labor market. While this uncertainty will certainly pose many challenges for our community, it also offers many opportunities for the Johnson County Community College. The Board of Trustees working alongside all stakeholders, we can ensure that we succeed in the shared vision uh, of the college that is to transform lives and strengthen communities. With your support, I know I can make a difference to teachers, students, and to our community as a trustee. Tonight, I'm asking for your support and your vote on or before November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our candidates. I would like to take a moment to remind everyone watching that all candidates were invited to attend and were given instructions for accepting the forum invitation and guidelines for tonight's events. And all candidates accepted and responded to communication except for Mark Hamill, who never responded. Martha Rose Davis originally accepted the invitation, but in the last few weeks has removed her campaign websites and deactivated her email. The League of Women Voters encourages all attendees to go to www vote411.org to find out more about all of our Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees candidates and other candidates on your ballot. That concludes tonight's program. Many thanks to all of the candidates for joining us tonight. Hopefully you all found this informative and educational and please make sure that you vote in November. Thank you.